Hello and welcome to Data Driven, the podcast where we explore the emerging fields of data science, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. In this episode, Frank and Andy speak with Peter Voss. Peter Voss is the world's foremost authority in artificial general intelligence or AGI. In fact, he is the one who coined the term in 2001 and published a book on the topic in 2002. He is a serial AI entrepreneur, technology innovator who has for the past 20 years been dedicated to advancing artificial general intelligence. Today he is focused on his company iGo which is developing and selling increasingly advanced AGI systems for large enterprise customers. Peter also has a keen interest in the interrelationship between philosophy, psychology, ethics, futurism, and computer science. I think you will find this interview a fascinating look at the future of AI. Now on with the show. Hello and welcome to Data Driven, the podcast where we explore the emerging fields of data science, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. If you like to think of data as the new oil, then you can think of us like, well, car talk, because we focus on where the rubber meets the road. And with me on this epic virtual road trip down the information highway, uh, because we're still locked in quarantine, (laughs) as always, is Andy Leonard. How's it going, Andy? Good, Frank. How are you? I'm doing well. We uh, we had a bit of snow. Uh, we're recording yes. this on uh, Monday, February 1st, and uh, the East Coast has been blanketed in some snow. Yeah, we got more than we've gotten probably since 2018 or so, uh, about four inches here in Farmville, and then almost an inch of ice on top of that, which always makes it fun, right? Yeah, the ice is worse than the snow, honestly. So I went out to walk the dog today and one of the dogs and it was crunch, crunch, crunch. So there's a nice layer of ice over everything, which is going to make driving later fun. But I do have, uh, I do have the, uh, an all wheel drive car, which is fantastic. I will never not own one of those again. Nice. (laughs) Yeah. You've seen it. It's the CRV. Yes. Yeah. It's nice. You did well. I dubbed it the Rocinante. (laughs) (laughs) In case uh, our listeners are not familiar with that, it's uh, with what Frank is referring to. It is not the old novel. Frank is not tilting at, at windmills. Uh, instead, and if I got that reference wrong, correct me. Frank. I'll just edit that out. No, you were right. It's from okay. um, this. Um, oh my God, Don Quixote, wasn't it? Don Quixote. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Cervantes. So, I was going to say from Cervantes's book, and I'm like, oh, what was the name of that? <laughs> Which is the okay, opposite good. of how most people think, but that's what I do. There we go. But uh, it is actually a reference to both the books and the series, The Expanse, of which Frank and I are great fans. So Awesome. But you know I who's like not it. covered in snow today? Who is not covered in snow Our today? Our guest, who yeah. uh, lives in, uh, I'm assuming, sunny or smoky, I guess, depending on the time of year, uh, California, uh, Peter Voss. Peter, welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, yes, it's um, we've got snow on the mountains here, but uh, it's very sunny. It's uh, it's nice, and we have a lot less smog these days. Very good. Nice. So you uh, are are um, the one of the world's, uh, or if not the world's, foremost authority in AGI or artificially uh, artificial general intelligence, and um, I believe you're the one that coined the term. Uh, yes, correct. In uh, 2001, um, myself and two other people, we coined the term artificial general intelligence, AGI, to to really uh, dis- distinguish the, the kind of work we were doing from, um, you know, a specialized a narrow AI, which is pretty much what everybody else is doing the original dream of artificial intelligence was, of course, to have systems that can think and learn the way humans do, but that turned out to be a lot, lot harder than people thought. So over the years, AI really turned into narrow AI, uh, using human ingenuity to figure out how to solve one particular problem, like playing chess or container optimization uh, or medical diagnosis, and then to write a program um, or to train data to do that, to solve that particular problem. But it's really the external intelligence of the program or the data scientist that is then encoded 
uh, to solve that problem. Whereas we wanted to get back to the original dream of having a thinking machine that it can figure out how to do these things and and learn the way humans do. So that's why we uh, felt we had to to you know coin a, a separate term to distinguish it from narrow AI. Interesting. So for years, AGI has been kind of thought the stuff of science fiction. I think there was a lot of optimistic people, like you said, that thought we would have it by now. Um, I know this is kind of a loaded question, but one, do you think we'll ever get there? And two, what, what's the sort of time frame we're looking at? Uh, yes, it's an interesting question. So absolutely, I believe it's uh, it's possible. And in fact, the reason we got together, we wrote a book called Artificial General Intelligence, uh, as I say, in 2001, was because we believed the time is ripe uh, to get back to this original dream that the technology had advanced enough, both hardware and software technology and cognitive uh, psychology, cognitive science, that we now understood enough and had fundamentally had the tools uh, in place to tackle this problem and to solve it. So I, I absolutely believe that um, it can be solved soon. And in fact, we believe we are on, on the way of, of, of solving this problem. Now, in terms of time frame, um, normally the way I answer this question is, I don't measure it in time, I measure it in dollars. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Time is money. So I guess that's a reasonable... Correlation. Yeah, and, and the reason I do I say that is because still today almost nobody is working on AGI. You know, ninety nine percent of all the effort in artificial intelligence is still on narrow AI. So, if this continues, it will take a long, long time uh, for us to reach human level AGI. But if that changes uh, and, you know, the kind of funding that's going into deep learning, machine learning suddenly was applied to AGI, then I think it could easily happen in less than 10 years. Oh, wow. That's very cool. So I'm curious, is there any um, like lead in? Does, does time and money invested in deep learning and narrow AI, does any of that help move the cause, uh, say further the cause for AGI? Um, slightly, uh, I believe, uh, you know, obviously any advances in, in languages and data collection, uh, in, in hardware development and the general experience in that sense, it does help it. But in another sense, it's actually the opposite. It's actually hindering it because a whole generation of, uh, software engineers and data scientists are now coming into the field uh, believing that deep learning, machine learning is a way to do it and all we need is more more data, more horsepower, and we'll solve this problem. And that's, uh, I think, barking up the wrong tree and it's a, it's a dead end. So in that sense, what's happening today with deep learning, machine learning is actually uh, counter to achieving AGI. Interesting. Very interesting. Was it always that way or it's just the way the market kind of went frenzied over just narrowed AI? Well, we've had several winters of AI, you know, the, the disappointments over the decades, um, you know, when we had expert systems, people believed that, you know, they would really, you know, show real intelligence and then it kind of fizzled out. And so we've had, we've had various winters. And, but of course, deep learning, machine learning has been so spe spectacularly successful in, in several areas, you know, image recognition, uh, improving speech recognition and, you know, various other fields uh, that just, you know, it's the only game in town is it has been very, very successful. Uh, but people are also starting to realize what the limitations are um, of it. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of at the moment, the only game in town and it has really been successful in many areas. So what are those limitations and how does AGI address them? Yeah, so um, fundamentally, when you think about intelligence, you know, if you think about uh, just common sense, uh, if we talk to a person and we judge them to be intelligent or to be totally non-intelligent, the kind of things we expect is that they uh, can learn immediately. That when you say something, A, they understand what you're saying and they integrate that knowledge with their existing knowledge. So, you know, if you say, um, 
my sister's moving to Seattle next week or something, that knowledge needs to fit in somewhere. You know, you know the person who's talking, you may know who the sister is, or you may not know who the sister is. Uh, you probably know what Seattle is. Uh, it, you may have images of, you know, rain <laughs> pouring down all the time <laughs> or, or whatever. But so you integrate that knowledge. And if you're not clear, it might maybe the person has two sisters. So then you would ask, do you mean your elder sister, you know, your younger sister? Um, and so we expect a, an intelligent human to basically do, you know, what's technically called one shot learning. You hear something once, you see an image once, you learn that and you integrate it into your existing uh, knowledge base. And if you're not sure how to interpret it, then you ask clarifying questions uh, until you know what it uh, what it is. So you have deep understanding, uh, you have disambiguation, you have uh, learning, instant learning, one shot learning. Um, you have long term memory. You remember that next week. You you know if you paid attention, you you'll remember that. Uh, and you have reasoning ability. Now, deep learning, machine learning, uh, as as it's done today, um, really doesn't offer any of those. So, if you if you had a human and you told them something and they didn't remember it, they didn't understand it, they didn't ask for clarification, you wouldn't think of them as being very intelligent, uh, would you? No, I mean my kids are smart, but when I tell them to bring the trash cans back from the street, they'll conveniently forget. But I I think I know where you're going with that. Yes. Right. <laughs> but the the question I have, it sounds like you're trying to, and, and I know this is going to be not really a good analogy, or maybe it is, you're trying to code for curiosity. Uh, that's very much part of it. But, you know, even deeper is understanding. Basically, when you have some input, do you do you understand, do you know what the implications are, how it fits in with the rest of the knowledge that you have? And you know, even that, that's sort of more, even more fundamental than curiosity. But yeah, curiosity is then uh, wanting to gather more information. So this is inter inherently an interactive process. You know, an intelligent person would ask uh, follow-up questions, you know, they would want to kind of fill in the pieces of the puzzle and, uh, you know, that they can be more in fact effective in their communication on their, or, or their job. Right. Uh, so, so yes, so, that's definitely part of it. So calling back to your example of someone's sister moving to Seattle, you you would ask, you know, I didn't know you had a sister or how many sisters do you have or how many siblings do you have and where is she moving to? Why? I guess that's kind of, I guess it's all about building that knowledge map inside your exactly. head or the, your exactly. head being could be a program, I guess. Yeah. And deep learning, machine learning really doesn't allow for that at all. You know, you accumulate masses of data and you train a model, but that model is then static. It's a read-only model. You know, it doesn't dynamically learn. So it may have an, so, sort of a knowledge graph, but even that knowledge graph is is very opaque. It's, uh, um, yeah, it's not scrutable, you know, and, and this is... This is such a big problem with uh, deep learning, machine learning, that you don't know why it gives a certain response, um, which which is a, a huge problem. So you really need um, a, a knowledge representation that's also understandable, scrutable. You know that it can say, "Well, why do you say that?" Uh, well, you know, uh, Jane told me, or I read it here, or you know, I figured it out. I thought about it. You know, right. So the question I have then would be, you mentioned deep learning doesn't work and to solve this problem, what sorts of models do, like what sorts of, what is it, what is it, you know, what do you think would solve this problem? And, you know, is it reinforcement learning based? Is it some variant of existing kind of other models? Right. Um, so um, the, the number of different ways of looking at it, one of the, um, one of the ways of looking at it that I found quite useful is uh, a few years ago, DARPA gave some presentations about uh, the third wave of AI or the three waves of AI. And uh, how they categorized it is the first wave was basically logic programming. And this is what AI was all about for the first few decades. It was very much logic based, um, you know, formal, formal logic. And we still see a lot of that that today. 
Um, but that would be like flow charts and decision trees and, 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 and things like that. That's the first wave. The second wave is, is basically uh, deep learning, machine learning, or neural networks, um, statistical models. Um, that's the second wave, and that's really where we're in. Now, what they call the third wave is essential, essentially a cognitive architecture, something that's inherently designed uh, to have all of the features required for intelligence. So it's, a, you know, the, the things that I just rattled off, uh, that you can learn immediately, that you have a deep understanding, that you will ask for clarification, you have a knowledge representation that allows, that's not opaque, that's not a black box. Uh, so you start off with an architecture, a cognitive architecture, and there have been a few around over the years, a few cognitive architectures, but they've never really taken off uh, for, for, for various reasons that we can go into. So you keep saying intelligence, and I think this is an important, at least for me. Um, what is there a distinction? I suspect there is between intelligence and sentience. Uh, yes and no. I mean, in terms, you know, what we're talking about here is, of course, human type intelligence, human level intelligence. Mm -hmm. And um, you really have to be aware, you have to be conscious. I mean, conscious is such a loaded term, but if we just yeah. use the, the synonym of, of aware, awareness, you have to be aware of your surroundings. You have to be aware of who are you communicating with. Uh, you have to be aware of yourself as an entity. There has to be self-awareness because you have to be able to tell the difference between uh, whether you caused something in the world or somebody else or something else caused something in the world. So the, there has to be a self-concept, self-awareness. So yes, awareness is essential for the kind of intelligence we're talking about. Interesting. But I mean, that, that, would, that would start kicking open other kind of ethical concerns like what, and again, this is, we're a show about data science and AI, not necessarily philosophy, <laughs> But I mean, there, there's also kind of that notion of, you know, awareness, sentience, and I guess, for lack of a better term, personhood. Uh, yes, absolutely. One. I mean, once you talk about a machine having human level intelligence, you know, even setting aside the whole debate of is it really conscious, you know, what, a, right. what about the hard problem of consciousness? And I mean, if you just ignore that, if you are interacting with a machine that you know, by all accounts, is aware of itself as an entity, which, as I say, it has to be uh, to to be at human or at, at a useful level of intelligence. It has to be aware of itself as an as an acting entity. Um, yeah, it makes it makes us uh, feel very uncomfortable because the only other experience we have of self aware beings are other humans. Right. So it's 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 something we basically have to to learn to adapt with that no this is a machine and it'll tell you that hey i'm a machine <laughs> i'm not a human right <laughs> right well peter um what are your thoughts about i guess boundaries on uh, how these machines would learn uh, the the agis versus how some of the ais have been taught uh, in the past we've seen when they interact publicly when they you know, to have a conversation similar to what you described, um, you know, about a sister in Seattle. We've seen AIs led astray. Uh, yes, there's certainly uh, in the early days. I mean, it's a bit like having a child growing up. Um, you know, if it's, if it's an environment where everybody swears and the child will swear, you know, and won't think anything of it, it doesn't doesn't know whether it's appropriate or inappropriate. It, you know, it was obviously appropriate in that environment. Right. Um, so uh, you, you clearly need to give it the right kind of uh, grounding or, or, or sort of kernel of knowledge and behavior that, that you expect it to have. Uh, and so that, that's sort of in a, you know, supervised learning and, and I'm not, I don't mean supervised in the sort of technical sense, but you know, right. human in, in the loop, give it the right background knowledge but once it gets to a point where you can actually communicate with it, where you can talk to it, and here we're now talking about a rational, a hyper-rational being, uh, unlike humans, you know, we are, rationality came very, very late in, in the evolutionary uh, chain. 
so whereas an AI inherently doesn't have the reptile brain, <laughs> you know, to start off right. with. Um, so if you explain to it, well, no, that's not what you say to a customer or that's not how, what you say in this under these circumstances, then, oh, okay, fine. I won't, you know, I get it. <laughs> so, so as long as the learning switch remains on. Correct. Yeah, as long be... as it's open to learn, it has. It doesn't have its own ego or thing that has to prove itself or be like, hey, I'm going to be really bad, you know. <laughs> so, right. Throw a tantrum. You know, you're not going to get that. So, oh, okay, fine. Uh, now I understand. So, yeah, I won't do that again. I'm thinking of the movie Chappie about kind of an AI that kind of learns from a bad environment. Yeah, yeah, that that was a fantastic movie actually. Yeah. Yeah. That was it it it's kind of a it's it just an interesting thing is if you if folks haven't seen the movie it's about a artificially intelligent kind of police robot that gets in the hands of criminals. Um and I don't want to spoil anything but I mean it's an interesting kind of thought experiment of like huh, you know, who trains the in that case I guess who trains the AI uh is um you know, can change the outcome of, of, uh, what the AI learns. Yeah. yeah. That, that movie was filmed, uh, made in South Africa. I, I lived there for a long time. So it was quite cool, uh, kind of to see places I recognized. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Very cool. uh, it's a well-made movie, actually low budget movie, but, uh, very well made. Yeah. Uh, Neil Blumenkamp, is that the director? I don't recall. Oh, he's made a bunch of movies. I think he was also behind District 9, which was also relatively yes. low budget, but really high quality. Correct. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. Definitely thought provoking uh, there. And I I hear you. It just doesn't sound um, easy or simple to uh, program. I'm trying, I guess the right word I'm looking for is morality or, or something that's given a higher priority then, you know, that that overarches the operating parameters of the learning that takes place or even the acceptance of learning, something that maybe filters, you know, the, the learning that makes it into the code and is, you know, then um, and, and then applied to how the AI responds. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, th I think there's a, a big misunderstanding in when people talk about AI safety and you know, the morality built into uh, built into the system. Um, the kind of system we're talking about is there's actually going to be relatively little in code. Most of its knowledge and abilities and values and things are really going to be in the knowledge graph and are therefore adaptable. Um, now, you know, the, the sort of scary part of that is that, yes, in a way, the system will can change its own code. It can change its knowledge, its, you know, skills and and so on on the fly but you also you're not going to be um shoehorned by you know or, or crippled by whatever mistakes you may have made in in coding because you're not going to code in ethics i mean that's absurd you you, right. you can't do that you know it's 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 a very high level intellectual process um and here we're talking about uh, ethics where somebody actually thinks about it. Of course, we often are ethical or not so much uh, based on just emotional responses without us really exactly. thinking about it. You know? Yeah. So in this kind of framework, I mean, what would your thoughts be on the, is it the Asimov three laws? Uh, yeah. I mean, they, uh, you know, Asimov uh, wrote a lot of books after that, basically explaining why the three laws actually can't work. <laughs> Uh, so, I mean, they they need to be contextualized. Um, it, it's sort of a starting point. I think it's a good thought experiment um, to to start off with, but it doesn't. It's not really something you can encode because things are really contextual. They're hierarchical. Um, now, uh, are there uh, you know moral dilemmas? Of course, there are. You know, in in right. the real world, often in the real world, you have to choose between the lesser of two evils, and it may not be easy to to do that. You know that, you know something bad's going to happen, and whatever whatever input you give um, might change the outcome, but it's still going to be bad. You know, right? Uh, it's also subjective too. Yeah, right. And uh, but you know that's not what everyday life is about, really. I mean, those are kind <laughs> of true. 
emergency type situations. I mean, everyday life morality is actually uh, should be much clearer. And I've actually written quite extensively about uh, about that in my own research on into AI. I, I stepped into philosophy and figuring out what free will is and consciousness and and morality was a you know kind of a, an important thing for me to to understand and um, uh, you know the m- morality first and foremost should be about human flourishing. I mean this is in the human domain and as we have robots or software that help us, that will be their reason for being is to help humans. Right. And uh, now if they can objectively learn what flourishing entails, human flourishing, um, now there are many subtleties, but in a a gross way, one could say, well, yes, it's actually pretty obvious what human flourishing involves if you just focus on the negatives. I mean, you want uh, good physical health. Right. You know, and that entails you have enough to eat, you have shelter and, you know, this sort of um, uh, Maslow's, uh, you know, level levels of hierarchy, uh, Maslow's, um, you know, levels of well-being. So, um, you know, being healthy, being mentally healthy. And then as you move up that, that ladder, you can say sort of spiritual well-being. And I don't mean religious by that. I mean, sort of the appreciation of uh, of art, of friendship, you know, of family, and 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 things things like that, sort of things of the mind that are not uh, not directly to do with mental well being or or health. Um, I mean, those are the things that are human flourishing. Uh, and if the robot can, or the the program, the AI uh, can measure its performance against that, then you know that, that that's sort of a fairly simple reference point. Interesting. I, so I love that term. Um, you know, human flourishing as the uh and, you know, as the measurement. I, I think that's that's a noble goal. Um I just I, and I'm I haven't read uh the you know much of your work, Peter. I apologize for that, but now I'm going to uh hearing you say that because I, I think that is a that's probably a good path to follow towards achieving what Asimov was after in the early novels where he talked about the three laws, he was definitely trying to solve that problem. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. I think, and and I, I concur. And I have read some of his work where later he said, yeah, this would break down. And in fact, some of his novels, his later novels even talk about that. That's in, that's coded into it. So very interesting thinking. Um, it, it reminds me a little and feel free to say, no, Andy, you're, you're full of uh, stuff. It's nothing like this, but it sounds an awful lot like we're trying to do uh, very something very analog using some very digital means. Yeah, uh, I think that's true. But you know, my original training was an electronics engineer, so uh, I don't see uh, such a huge distinction between analog and digital. Uh, uh, you know, I mean. Uh, yes, uh, the meta of degrees, I think that's important. And so right. context is always super important. You know, something that may be just totally wrong in one context may be absolutely right in another context. So I think that those subtleties, um, that is not just a decision tree. So in, in that sense, yeah, I t- totally agree with you. A sort of binary is you go down this path and then you go down another path. You know, it's basically that you can flowchart everything. And I think that's one of the uh, the, the very positives of, of deep learning, machine learning, is sort of the return of of the of neural networks and and right. sort of st- statistical uh, type of approaches. Um, but you know, by themselves, you can't just work on statistics. Totally agree with that. My background is also electronics engineering, um, and uh, it it reminds me more of digital signal processing um, more than just about anything else. That and that's what I see in a lot of these decision support systems, business intelligence, and even machine learning and AI that are being applied at at least to uh, say manufacturing and and sales. You know, there's signals. They're just signals coming in, and then there are responses that interpret 
you know, we interpret the signals and then we prescribe responses. Right. And, and I think the other thing that's, that's missing there, I mean, a lot of deep learning, machine learning, uh, just have binary outputs, basically. They're just categorizers. You know, they give you a category answer and not sort of a degree of, of or at least that isn't u- utilized. But there's even something much more important, which also relates to signal processing, uh, is you really want a feedback system. You want a dynamic system. Uh, it needs to interact with the world and, and sort of find its own equilibrium, you know, in whatever it's trying to do. So we talked about human flourishing and helping humans. And I think that dovetails nicely into kind of, it kind of helps, I think, paint a background picture of what you're doing now with IGO. Do you want to talk a little bit about kind of, um, you know, what IGO has done? Um, you know, obviously I have the, the, the talking points, but, you know, um, you know, it seems like, it seems like IGO is a fulfillment of a much larger mission if I if I can kind of infer that, uh, yes, absolutely. So in two thousand one, I also started my first AI company uh, after several years of doing my own research, and uh, it was really to start building AGI systems, systems that can learn and learn and reason more like humans do. Um, but of course, it's really really hard. So we had to start with you know something simpler. For the first few years, we just built various prototypes, uh, basically testing out the ideas, the theory that I had, and and building a framework. And then by 2008, we started commercializing this in the call center space, uh, basically having um, natural language conversations. Um, but you know at a at a very primitive level, but much more advanced than the kind of things we all hate when you call into a company and you press one for that and three for that, or, you know, you say something that has can't understand that. So that, that company smart action uh, launched in 2008, was basically the first generation of our technology that we commercialized. Um, and the company is now about a hundred people and, uh, you know, doing a great job at providing these, uh, this call automation. But I found myself getting bogged down uh, with, you know, HIPAA compliance, you know, security, PCI compliance, scalability, redundancy, you know, security, all of those kinds of things, the nuts and bolts of delivering a SaaS service. So I exited the company and started Igo.ai uh, seven years ago. Um, and for for five years, again, we were just in R&D mode. I mean, that the, the reason we did it for five years was partly because I funded the company and the funding I got was limited to 12 people. So we had, like, on average, 12 people work on it, build the second generation of our brain, of our AGI-type architecture. And uh, so two years ago, we then got to a point where we're happy with the second generation to commercialize it. And this is really what IGO is today is the second generation of this uh, conversational AI, natural language conversational AI engine that uh, now in our current uh, commercial focus is on on, uh, chatbots. So we call it a chatbot with a brain. But yes, you can sort of see from the whole history, ultimately what we're aiming at, what the goal of the company is, is to have uh, what we call a personal, personal assistant. And that is sort of my vision and my my dream that ultimately everybody in the world can have their own personal assistant that it's like a little angel sitting on your shoulder that you you know maybe not quite your best friend, hopefully you, your best friend will still be human, <laughs> but your <laughs> your personal assistant will it's it's really more like an extension of your 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 own brain and like an exocortex you know, that can help you remember things, help you figure out things, and, and of course, do the kind of things we'd, we'd, we'd love for, you know, Siri or Alexa to do if they were really smart. Uh, that, that's really that personal assistant. The reason uh, we actually call it a personal, personal assistant, and the reason we do that is they are actually, well, it should be personal, personal, personal assistant. They are actually three different meanings of the word personal that are all very important. Um, so the, the one uh, personal that it's yours, you own it, you control it, not some mega corporation. So it serves your, your purpose. So it's a one personal. Second personal is that it's personalized to you. So it's not that one size fits all. It's, you know, it knows 
your preferences, your history, what you're interested in, your understands your context. And the third personal is that it's private, that you control what it shares with whom. So that's our vision to have a human level understanding personal, personal assistant uh, that can help um, optimize individuals' lives, that can help you cut through fake news, you know, make better decisions in, in life and, and, and so on. And so the commercial path we're taking in, you know, providing an IVR with a brain, a chatbot with a brain is basically for us to move towards that, that goal in the long term. Interesting. First off, I love the term exocortex. I think that sums it up exactly. Um, because I have, I have Google assistant, I have Siri, I have, I have one of kind of every device, you know, whether it's, uh, if I say her name, she'll speak up, she'll, but <laughs> you know who I'm talking about starts with an A. Um, but I also have Cortana and, you know, each one of them has their own strengths, but none of them really, uh, we actually did a, a live stream on this and, you know, they, they don't really understand context and that, at least that's what I call it. But I think I know what, what you would the term you were using is kind of an, a knowledge graph, you know, like, right. you know, if, you know, my, my in-laws will be in town for the next two weeks, say, right. And if I told my personal, personal assistant that then it would know, you know, not to schedule or maybe to schedule, uh, you know, trips or whatever, <laughs> whatever right. that happens. Exactly. but, yeah. but um, you know, and then, and that kind of humorous example, I love my in-laws if you're listening. Um, it's not aimed at you, but, um, but, uh, you know, we would know, like you would want to spend more time with the family or even less time or kind of factor that into whatever scheduling kind of conflicts may come up. Is that, is that a kind of a. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And in fact, on our website, we, we have, uh, an, an Igo versus Alexa exactly to compare the kind of conversations you'd like to have and you you can have if you have a more intelligent system and the the current technology which is really just a stimulus response you know you say something it categorizes it, it, it you know picks out the intent that you want and then uh, it'll just execute a response you know there might be a little tiny little flow chart thing you know like if you say give me uber it might ask you well where do you want to go to and you know how many people are going and do you want uber x but right. you know it's just a scripted flow chart so it's, it's really uh all the current uh, chatbots or you know, sometimes i call them personal assistants uh are actually all the combination of uh, wave one and wave two technology. It's basically a wave two technology to try and figure out what the intent is. And that'll be one of a few hundred items that, that the system can do. Uh, so the, you know, intent recognition, and then it triggers basically a response and that response, somebody sat down and, you know, typed it out or did an API call if it's a weather report or, or, or whatever. But, you know, there's no, there's no deep understanding, there's no context, there's no learning, there's no reasoning, there's no disambiguation. Um, yeah, there's no brain. Right. No, I mean, that makes sense. Um, because we've all had those experiences when we talk to these devices where they just don't get it. You know, <laughs> right. it's kind of, it's very easy to anthropomorphize them and think that, you know, there's a thought behind it. And I see my kids do this, like they'll interact with it. And then, you know, uh, they'll, you'll, they'll hear, you know, I'm sorry, I can't help you with that, you know, and it's kind of like, they get frustrated with them. And, you know, and I, I get it, like, I, I understand, but um, Microsoft, funny story, Microsoft actually had a video um, at one of the trade conferences when we could travel, uh, where they showed, they called it turns. So they show somebody inter. um you basically having a whole conversation starting from their car. Hey, remind me to do this. Remind me to do that. And the AI was able to keep up through across, let's say two or three dozen context switches. Hmm. You know, and it's a miracle if any of these current day, as of you know, state of the art, as of twenty twenty one, can can follow one, let alone two context switches. So it sounds like you're kind of addressing that by putting intelligence in the back end and not just um, you know, natural language processing kind of muscle, for lack of a better term. Yeah. Sounds like you're building something in the back. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's why we call it uh, 
a chatbot with a brain and it's a brain that's the important thing the brain has the ability to you know it has the knowledge graph that is dynamically updated as it learns it has deep language understanding it has reasoning uh, it has context short term memory long term memory all of all of those capabilities are there in the in the background basically managing the conversation and learning as you go along and making sense of things and um you know, at the moment, that's nowhere near human level, uh, but it's having the right architecture to start off with to be able to to do that. I mean, over the years, we've seen many demos like that, you know, in a very constrained environment. You can right. code something together with a flow chart and, and so on that looks very impressive, but you put it out in the wild and it just falls apart immediately. Right. I've delivered a lot of demos showing off kind of the the our technology and I'm always very careful about having guardrails on what I talk about how I talk about it <laughs> for good reason um and it's not just you know not just Microsoft but I think most of the mainstream ones are are kind of constrained by that so with this point uh we ask seven kind of questions um just to kind of help the audience kind of uh know you a little better um, some of these are fill in the blanks. Um, none of these are complicated questions or uh, weighty questions. Um, so the first one is, how did you find your way into AI? Um, did or did it was it the other way around? Did AI find you? <laughs> yeah. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, I started off elect- as, as an electronics engineer, and um, then I've, I fell in love with programming as chips became programmable, uh, programmable. I started programming them and I said, this, this is so much fun uh, and instant gratification. You can write something and, you know, see the results immediately. Whereas with in electronics, you have to build a new circuit board and wait days or weeks uh, for, for, you know, to come together. So I had an electronics company. Uh, and so my company turned into a software company uh, and we actually did very well. I, developed an ERP software system, a comprehensive software system uh, for medium-sized businesses. And our company grew very rapidly. We actually did an IPO um, and uh, that was fantastic. But uh, the reason I'm telling that story is that A, uh, the experience of writing software, writing ERP software and I wrote three generations of it. I architected and did a lot of the coding myself. I was very proud of the software that we had, but I also realized how dumb it is. You know, anything that the programmer doesn't think of uh, will just, it won't know what to do. It, it, you know, it'll just throw an error. And, I, you know, I thought you have to be able to do something more intelligent. How, how can you bring intelligence into software? And doing the IPO as a company being successful, uh, you know, gave me enough sort of time and money when I exited the company to to say, okay, let me deeply understand what intelligence entails. And so I took off five years to to study intelligence, but also related fields, um, epistemology, you know, theory of knowledge and philosophy, um, cognitive psychology, uh, uh, psychometrics, how do we measure intelligence? Uh, you know, IQ tests, what do IQ tests measure? Are they meaningful? And how do children learn? Uh, how does our intelligence differ from animals and, and all of that? And then, of course, I studied a lot of AI uh, to understand artificial intelligence and what had been done in the field. So uh, over a five-year period, I basically put all of that together. And I mean, it's once I got into this idea of understanding intelligence and seeing the potential of building a machine that has intelligence, uh, I mean, what could be more exciting? So I've I've been on a on a buzz for you know last twenty five years really uh, in, uh, in in this. Uh, yeah, I don't know if it found me or I found it, but <laughs> here we are. <laughs> well, that's very impressive. Um, I, I would uh, and and thank you for doing all of that work. That's that's not easy. That's almost a mission more than you know any kind of say mission statement. Um, so I admire that. Um, our next question is, what's your favorite part of your current gig? Yeah, so, I, I mean, I, I couldn't think of doing anything else. And I actually work seven days a week. And uh, But to me, it's not work. I mean, this is what I, I, I love to do. And I actually 
I actually love, I'm one of these rare animals. I like, I love both the, the theory and the technology on the one hand, but also business. I'm CEO of the company and I love interacting with customers. I like the business aspects of it. So I like to see technology, um, you know, go from theoretical research and understanding stuff and actually making making a difference in the world and generating revenue because if it's of value to somebody, they'll pay you for it. So I really love both aspects of, of, of my work. Awesome. So uh, here's our first complete this sentence. When I'm not working, I enjoy blank. Okay. Only one. Uh, well, I, I mean, as many as you like, I mean, as long as you keep it, uh, you know, G yeah. or PG rated. All right. Yeah. Uh, I love, I love music concerts. When we could go to concerts, I go to concerts. I love hiking and I love riding my motorbike. So I guess there's three. Cool. That's very cool. So we have uh, our second of three fill in the blanks. I think the coolest thing in technology today is blank. Oh, that we have so many people, uh, that AI is exciting again. That's a great answer. Um, I start when I was in college during the, uh, well, my first AI winter, and it was pretty, uh, pretty dismal. I took a prologue course and my professor was just a huge fan of prologue that was going to change the world. Right. And I kept waiting for like, okay, when's the big reveal? When's the big reveal? <laughs> Yeah. Final project? Nope. Still no big reveal. All right. <laughs> um, complete. Here's another um, uh, complete the sentence. Um, I look forward to when I can use the, the to the day uh, when I can use technology to blank. To have a personal assistant that can help me in my life. Yeah, me too. Cool. I'm going to put that above self-driving car. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Very nice. Well, we ask uh, our, our next question is uh, to share some, not really a question, a request, share something different about yourself. Um, and we put a reminder on here to remember it's a family podcast. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, what, what I think a lot of people when they meet me think is, is weird is, is uh, how much I'm into um, futurism and life extension technology. I love life and I'd like to live for as long as I can. Uh, so I'm very health conscious. I've actually been on calorie restriction for the last 20 years to try and, wow. you know, stay as healthy as possible. Um, and, you know, many other aspects of, of life extension that I'm, I'm interested in. Uh, of course, COVID isn't exactly helping the, the, <laughs> the general thing of right. life extension, you know, but Again, I, I find it so uh, distressing that so few people actually care about, you know, staying healthy and living living a long life and how little money actually goes into life extension research. So I'm very much into that. But then also what's different about me that I also love motorcycles. So there, I guess, um, <laughs> a bit of a <laughs> contradiction. So uh, life has to be worth living too. <laughs> so. Understood. I like that. Um, I recently uh, came, uh, started reading a book called How Not to Die. I don't know if you're familiar with, oh, who's with the that author? work. Um, let's see. It's right here. And it's Michael uh, Grieger, I think is how you pronounce his last name. Grieger, yeah. Uh, yeah, it doesn't ring a bell Im immediately. Yeah. But yeah. Cool. All about, yeah, all about plant-based diets. I understand he has a fantastic YouTube channel. I haven't yet checked it out. So I'm just in the beginning stages of that. But the book is well written. Um, it sounds a little like listening to you talk about uh, the things you're passionate about as well. And he's been into this for decades. And, you know, just trying the same goal, trying to extend life. Right, right. Yeah, healthy life, of course. Yeah, sure, sure. And um, where can we find out more about what you're up to and what you're doing? Um, obviously, there's iGo, and I believe the URL is iGo.ai. Correct. Yeah, iGo.ai. So, uh, yeah, we have quite a couple of videos and some links to articles. And then 
most of my articles are on medium.com. So just look for my name, Peter Voss on medium.com. And uh, I have quite a number of articles there about philosophy, ethics, um, calorie restriction, even, of course, a lot about AI, AI and all sorts of things. Yeah. Rational Very ethics. Cool. Yeah. Very cool. Well, Audible is a sponsor of our show. Uh, listeners can get a free audio book by visiting thedatadrivenbook.com. And we like to ask our guests, Peter, if uh, they've listened to a good book or read a good book, if they don't listen to audio books. Yeah, you know, the thing that jumps to mind uh, is, is, is a book that's been around for a long time is uh, a mind, The Mind's Eye, which I think is, uh, is, is just a fantastic book by Doug Hofstadter and um, who's the other author. Anyway, you, you'd find it by that. It's just a great book about, yeah, what what the mind is and uh, and so on. Interesting. That Very name cool. sounds familiar, Doug Hofstetler. Yeah. What was he known for? Yeah, he's uh, he's he's one of the AI gurus. Uh, um, I think he was in New Mexico at. Um, uh, uh, it's get my mind now what what it is, but yeah, he's uh, he's a well known figure in in AI, but not really not for the last twenty years or so. Sort of more like eighties, nineties. Okay, awesome. We'll definitely record that. Uh, we'll definitely put these uh, recommendations in the show notes as well as links to your so your um, your articles on Medium. Uh, and we just like to remind our listeners that they can pick up a free audiobook because Audible is a sponsor. And uh, if you go to thedatadrivenbook.com, you will be taken to an Audible page and your first audiobook will be on us. And if you subscribe, uh, you get an Audible subscription, you will get a nice little pat on the back and uh, and maybe enough to buy a latte at Starbucks <laughs> and, and uh, uh, helps monetize the show and keep Andy and I caffeinated. Absolutely. That's important, you know. Very important. <laughs> this was a fantastic show. Uh, Peter, I can't thank you enough for taking time out of your day to talk with us. Um, I find the work fascinating. As we were chatting, I found your uh, articles on Medium, and it's a nice list, and the list is just of categories. I see there's several articles in some of the categories, and I'm going to read them. I'm going to be reading them and uh, and learning more uh, about AGI, so I appreciate that, sir. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me on, on the show and feel free to send me any questions or ideas that you have. I was looking to communicate with people who are interested in this. Awesome. awesome. Well, thank you very much for your time and we will let the nice British lady end the show. Thanks for listening to Data Driven. We know you're busy and we appreciate you listening to our podcast. But we have a favor to ask. Please rate and review our podcast on iTunes, Amazon Music, Stitcher, or wherever you subscribe to us. You have subscribed to us, haven't you? Having high ratings and reviews helps us improve the quality of our show and rank us more favorably with the search algorithms. That means more people listen to us, spreading the joy. And, can't the world use a little more joy these days? Now, go do your part to